This is the River Charles. And of course, that's a colonial name, some king, Charles. It's obvious that the settlers chose this river because water is everything and has always been everything for humans. The Native Americans who lived here maintained their relationship with the bivalves, the oysters, the mussels, the wetlands that were here. The settler mentality was geometry, was separation, was taxonomy, was naming, and sewage was, of course, a part of that problem. The first major treatment plant in the Boston system was actually 1957. Before that, there was no sewage treatment. There was pumping of sewage to the ocean. My name is Paul Levy. I'm a native of New York. I came to Boston, to Cambridge, to go to MIT as an undergraduate and stayed through graduate school getting a master's in city planning. And after that, I was involved in various positions in the state government with regard to energy and the environment and the like, notably running the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority, which is in charge of providing water and wastewater service to the Boston metropolitan area, to over two million people. With a vast metropolitan area such as Boston, you have a lot of sewage, and the modern mentality is one of externalizing that waste, not even acknowledging that that's a part of our system. Extreme density is one way to handle the human impact on the planet. You just crowd a lot of people together, but they produce a lot of waste. The River Charles was a toxic, polio-ridden, you know, cesspool. Much of the coastline of Boston Harbor has been preempted by industrial, commercial, and military uses. This has limited public access to the harbor and has obscured its very existence from many of the communities surrounding it. Early on, it was decided that the wastewater side of the, the water wastewater system would be highly centralized. That all the, all the sewage from 43 communities would be taken together and sent out to the ocean. That was a decision made in the 1890s. There's an example of how a decision made over a hundred years ago has ramifications that go on for decades. It's just the way it is. It was a big improvement in terms of public health. It stopped cholera and typhoid epidemics that were, that were quite common at the time. But in terms of long-term ecological health of Boston Harbor, it was not such a good idea. So it was, not, it was only in the 1950s when the first sewage treatment plant was built in the southern part of the system. The, Deer, the old Deer Island plant was not built until 1968. So it was not until 1968 that Boston had full sewage treatment. And then those plants that were built were too small, were improperly designed, and inadequately maintained, and so they didn't work. So with the passage of the Clean Water Act in the early 70s, there was a legal tool by which municipalities and communities could sue for redress, essentially, saying our infrastructure of water and sewage treatment is not adequate and you need to take care of that government. There's a very expensive process for cleaning that water. And for years, that system was neglected. And for years, Boston Harbor was one of the dirtiest harbors in the country um, because of what was being discharged into it. When I was at the Water Authority, we began and a few years later, it was completed a $4 billion project to build the Deer Island treatment plant and the other facilities to separate the sludge from the, from the water. On a dry day, when it's not raining and it hasn't been raining, the amount of flow going to Deer Island is about 300 million gallons a day. On a very wet day, it's four times that. 
So we had to build the Deer Island plant with an average capacity of 300 million gallons a day, but a surge capacity of 1.2 billion gallons a day. They're just big recycling facilities. They take dirty water, they separate the, the clean water from the, from the dirty stuff, and, and recycle both of them. But it takes a lot of energy to do it. So this settler colonial mentality of separation carried on to Deer Island. Deer Island, as the name implies, was a one of the wild harbor islands that had, of course, been used by Native American communities for millennia. It was used by the settler colonials for their social waste. So reform schools, Irish worker prisons, everything. And we can think of excrement, we can think of sewage as also social waste. We made a social decision to externalize it, to pipe it very far out onto this island, where it is digested in a similarly bioreactive way as Gilberto Esparza's fantastic nucleo and bioreactors. Philosophically, we can decide to do whatever we want. We can say it's not appropriate to mix dirty water with clean water or, or dirty human excrement with clean water as a philosophical matter. Um, what we do know in terms of physics and engineering is if you choose to mix waste with clean water, it takes energy to take it out again. Because you, ha you have to separate the two in some kind of treatment process. And there's a cost to doing that. So if we were looking at it in strict economic terms or financial terms, and we wanted to design a system that was the least cost to a community, probably the ultimate decision we would make would be based on the density and the size of that community. If you can have an eco-village of a small number of people where water is not used as part of the waste, water, waste collection system, you still have to treat that waste in some way or compost it or whatever, and it might work perfectly well. But if we have apartment buildings side by side with hundreds of thousands of people in them, drinking water every day and excreting every day, the likelihood of being able to compost that on site is very small. This is the high service pumping station that was built in the late 1800s in order to take the water that was coming from the western suburbs, from the reservoirs, and to deliver it to the high elevations of, this, of Boston. And these are marvelous engines that were powered by coal, uh, steam engines, and they were they were very sophisticated for the time. We are extremely lucky in the Boston metropolitan area because of the thoughtful approach that was adopted by our predecessors. Uh, the idea of building a 400 billion gallon reservoir, having that water delivered by gravity to the metropolitan area, just think of the energy savings of not having to pump it. Um, and, the, and the maintenance issues that are, that are avoided. If you look across the United States, you'll find that inland cities like Chicago, Milwaukee, and so on, who were discharging into the lakes that were the source of their drinking water, had higher levels of sewage treatment because, in essence, they were drinking their sewage after treatment. So from the very, in Milwaukee in the 1920s, a, there was secondary treatment. In Boston, you didn't have to do that. You just sent it out to where the fish were. Well, the other thing to remember here is that water and sewer service is invisible to the public. It's the invisible infrastructure. And at the time, it was being run by a state agency that also ran the metropolitan area parks, the skating rinks, the swimming pools, the highways. 
And when the commissioner of the what was then the MDC would go to the state legislature looking for money to maintain the old Deer Island plant, they would say to him, legislators would say to him, you don't need money for that. You need a new swimming pool. We'll give you money for a new swimming pool or a new skating rink. And he'd say, well, no, my sewage treatment plant is falling apart. And they'd say, it's okay. I think it's really important for people to understand where the water comes from and where it goes so that they can be informed citizens and can support the collection of resources, meaning money, taxes and fees, to appropriately run these systems on which all of our societies depend. After air, we need water. And for that to happen, because these systems are for the most part invisible, for that to happen, it's really important to educate the current generation, but also future generations. So the city on a hill is predicated on an ideal where the spirit is what you think about every day and the body is cast down as an unnecessary sediment of the spirit. So Gilberto, with this work, totally upends that separation and brings us into an understanding of the symbiotic relationships of those very bodies, those very pilgrims' bodies who came with dirt on their boots, that planted seeds on this ground, who came with microorganisms in their gut that began to evolve with them on this continent. So the diseases were, of course, catastrophic for the Native American communities, but in other ways, that symbiosis now has to be rethought to include all the human and the more than human and all the waste which becomes food for other entities on the planet. <laughs>